Bon, uh, ja, de meeste mensen kennen jou wellicht al, de stadshoogleraar. En um, jij bent ook uh, initiatiefnemer van dit boek, ik zal het maar even omhoog houden, Shaping New Commons. En um, daar moet je misschien ook even wat meer over vertellen, er staan een aantal namen op. Wat, wat is het idee achter dit boek? Hoe is dit ooit ontstaan en begonnen? Ja, het is eigenlijk een uh, project, een programma wat we gemaakt hebben en begon toen, uh, net toen de pandemie op gang kwam en we zagen dat daar enorme effecten ontstonden. Toen maakten we ons zorgen over uh, wat hebben we nu straks nog aan gezamenlijkheden in de maatschappij. Die kwamen onder druk te staan. Uh, dus we hebben toen heel snel uh, eigenlijk allemaal wetenschappers van, van onze universiteit bij elkaar gebracht en die hebben op hun terrein uh, geschreven over wat is er aan de hand, wat zijn de effecten nu, wat kunnen we verwachten. Dus ja. dat was stap 1. Dus dat is een boek, dat lijkt op dit boek. Uh, maar daarna dachten we, oké, okay, nu hebben we een soort stand van zaken, ja. maar we willen ook wat actiever kijken naar wat moet er dan veranderen. Hè? Ik moet direct even natuurlijk zeggen wat commons zijn, want anders ja. denkt iedereen wat is het. Waar hebben we het over? Ja, ja, zeker. Maar wat we in dit deel van het programma hebben gedaan, dit project, uh, dat we dachten, laten we nu vooral ook uh, de jonge generatie vragen naar hun kijk op uh, hoe zou je tot, en dan pak ik een Nederlands woord, tot nieuwe gezamenlijkheden kunnen komen in een sterk veranderende tijd. Niet alleen corona, maar ook de klimaatcrisis. Nou, Oekraïne is erbij gekomen. Dus dit is het resultaat van een wedstrijd, een SC-wedstrijd. En hebben we dus gevraagd, uitgezet die, 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 die contest. En gevraagd, schrijf over jouw visie, zeg maar, op het creëren van nieuwkomers in de Precies. maatschappij. En, en een van die essays. En een van de, de winnaars, een van de bij, uh, de, degene die een bijdrage belevert, ja. ja, die zit hier ook naast. Precies. Ja. Daar gaan we uiteraard straks ja. ook over praten. Je schreef ook, we hadden natuurlijk even contact van tevoren, dat uh, eigenlijk een oude Nederlandse tegenhanger, uh, dat was de term de meent of de mint. Ja, die term komt... kende ik niet, misschien andere mensen ja. wel. Kent nee, iemand, er zijn ook bejaarden te huizen die zo heten, de meent. Uh, ik bedoel, je hebt, de meent is eigenlijk ook, het, uh, is eigenlijk ook een, een vertaling, inderdaad, zou je kunnen zeggen. Ja. En um, dan meteen maar even wat die commons dan zijn. Eigenlijk ja. komt het, uh, uit, het is natuurlijk een Engelse term. En in Engeland in de vroegste tijd was een common een soort gemeenschappelijk terreintje achter de boerderijen waar je gezamenlijk je, je vee liet grazen en uh, dingen kon doen. Maar waar je ook gezamenlijk uh, uh, verantwoordelijkheid voor had. Hè. Dus als je daar een puinhoop van maakte hè, en je liet alles maar slingeren of je vervuilde het, had iedereen daar last van. Ja. Nou, en eigenlijk staat dat uh, symbolisch hè, voor het idee dat je commons moet zien als uh, iets waar je gezamenlijk verantwoordelijkheid voor hebt, waar je ook gezamenlijke waarden hebt, waar je ook gezamenlijke middelen hebt, zeg maar resources, net zoals dat land bijvoorbeeld. Um, en dat kunnen dus uh, zowel fysieke plekken zijn, mm. hè, zoals we hier hebben we misschien een common in ontwikkeling, kunnen ja. we nog achteraf toetsen uh, straks. Ja, um, maar het kunnen ook, uh, in onze opvatting, het kan ook uh, digitaal zijn, ja. uh, uh, wat in het coronatijd natuurlijk ook begon. Nou, en dat is eigenlijk, uh, wij hebben, uh, onze analyse was, de oude commons, want die waren er al, die schoten tekort. Hè, los van het impact van corona. En waarom? Omdat ze eigenlijk, uh, ze waren uh, generatie-biased. Hè, de jongeren kwamen veel te weinig aan bod in die commons. Ze hadden te weinig oog voor internationale uh, solidariteit. En uh, mensen stonden centraal, maar het hele ecosysteem niet. Hè. Dus de new commons, uh, die zouden die defecten, zeg maar, moeten zien te overstijgen. Ja. En, en uh, nou zijn ook de, de, de essays die ik heb gelezen, zijn eigenlijk wat jij nu ook vertelt, zijn tamelijk groot, bijna mondiaal zou je kunnen zeggen. Ik kondig jou ook al aan, daar weten mensen waarschijnlijk ook wel, hè? je bent ook stadshoogleraar. Ja. Hoe zou je dit nou bijvoorbeeld ook kunnen toepassen, gewoon op een stad als Tilburg? Ja, zeker, hè? want nu klinkt het heel abstract, dat, ja. dat snap ik, hè? maar we zien het ook gewoon heel praktisch. Hè? Dus we willen ook proberen in de stad en in wijken nieuw commons tot stand te brengen. En dat sluit aan bij wat je ook overal in, in de maatschappij hoort, we zijn te veel allemaal eigen clubjes gaan vormen. Dus we kijken naar elkaar, weten niks van elkaar, vinden heel veel van elkaar. Er ontstaat segmentatie, polarisatie. Dus nieuwkomers zijn veel diverser dan, dan wat je eigenlijk nu vaak ja. ziet. Dus ook in wijken zouden we dus allerlei soorten mensen willen kijken van... Hoe kan je de wijk versterken, maar hoe kan je ook de problemen in de wijk aanpakken? Hè? Zonder dat er wordt gezegd, ja, dat, dat is hun schuld en hè, zij zijn anders en dat soort zaken. Ja. Dus ik denk dat dat ook uh, in de stad als Tilburg, hè, dat er heel veel plekken zijn waarin je die nieuwe gezamenlijkheden kunt creëren, is niet makkelijk. En, en zijn die voorbeelden er ook al? Dat je zegt, misschien noemen we het niet zomaar, dat wat daar gebeurt, dat nou, zie ja, je als stadshoogleer, dat is een mooi voorbeeld van wat ja. we meer zouden moeten ja, doen. Ja, nou, ik, ik zie dat bijvoorbeeld in, in Tilburg West, uh, zie ik dat ontstaan. Hè? Ja. Daar uh, zit ook uh, zeg maar een soort buurtcentrum, uh, uh, Wij zijn West. Ja. En daar is heel erg oog zeg maar, voor het belang van gezamenlijkheid in de wijk. Want die wijk is heel divers, hè, maar je ziet daar ook uh, uh, ja, dat bijvoorbeeld uh, jongeren zich heel erg uh, blijven afzonderen van het normale buurtwerk uh, ja. en van de buurthuizen. Dus 
daar is heel erg beseffen dat we dat ook uh, kunnen versterken. Mooi. Ook door bijvoorbeeld te zorgen dat er meer werk is voor mensen, meer activiteiten. Ja, ja. mooi. En uh, straks gaan we natuurlijk ook naar Magis en die buigt zich over de voors en tegens van digitale vormen van New Commons. En uh, jij gaf aan, hè, die hoeven in ja. jouw visie niet alleen maar ouderwets fysiek hoeven te zijn. Wat vond je mooi aan zijn betoog? Waarom is zijn betoog ook in het, in het boek terechtgekomen? Ja, nou ik denk dat omdat hij... Dus hij zegt aan de ene kant niet van digitale commons zijn alleen maar slecht. Hè. Die leiden tot uh, heel veel controle uh, ja. hè, en privacy schendingen. Maar zoals aan de andere kant, Facebook. zoals Facebook, hè, zeker. Hè. Dus Facebook en, en Metaverse komen in het boek best ja. vaak voor. Hè. Maar hij wil daar wel een soort iets tegenover zetten. Hè. Dus als we die kant ingaan, dan moeten we dingen doen. En als we dat niet doen, dan kan het inderdaad gewoon een, een dystopie worden. Hè. Dan ja. kan het slecht aflopen. Dus ik vind het positief hè, dat hij gewoon ook uh, iets ziet in digitale commons, ja. hè, maar ook heel realistisch is om te kijken van niet zoals we het nu doen. En, nou, en dat kan hij straks natuurlijk perfect vertellen ja. wat er dan wel moet gebeuren. Ja, precies. Ja. Nou, we gaan er inderdaad over doorpraten. Majay Gazawa, I hope I pronounced it right. Yes. Yes. And uh, thank you very much for being here and also thank you for writing the essay. Uh, Tom was also saying a little bit about what it's about. Uh, you wrote an essay on making a case for the adoption of neural rights. That is correct. Maybe we should start with that term. What, what are neural rights? So neural rights are basically a set of rights pertaining to the preservation and protection of human brain and mind. And what does that really mean? Um, it's really about protecting basically uh, our rights to mental integrity. So basically that you remain um, free from influence of rather very, hmm, how to say it? intrusive algorithm that basically can know anything about you by correlating uh, your activity with the activity of other people and basically sending you something that you may have thought about, not said outright, not uh, spoken to it about, uh, about it with anybody, but by collating uh, those kind of um, behaviors that you uh, well do on the internet with behaviors of other people, they are able to. Uh, basically insert and uh, neuroids is really about taking all of those kind of intrusions and really putting uh, kind of a mm, basically uh, wall around that or uh, basically cutting off uh, the intensity of the intrusion. Really. So ha has that to do with, with the phenomenon that it, if I like something, uh, I share something that uh, uh, Facebook for example learns about uh, what I like, what I dislike, and therefore learns about who I am. And maybe those are thoughts that I never share with someone, with my friends, for example. Is that what neural rights is about? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, when we talk, for example, about mental integrity, uh, there was one case of a woman which uh, didn't know that she was pregnant, but Facebook detected uh, all of her behaviors, collated with it with other pregnant women, and then she got to know by that she's pregnant by uh, basically the fact that Facebook started to serve her uh, ads that, uh, well, uh, related to her pregnancy. Yeah. So what you have is that those systems just know so much about us that they're able to exert uh, a lot of control. Yeah. And so, for example, in my, for my essay, uh, I use Max Weber a lot, but I also use well, read other authors that go more in-depth into that, yeah. such as Yasha Levine's Surveillance Valley or Tikkun's Cybernetic Hypothesis. Yeah. And they're much more kind of, uh, they're really radical in seeing the way that it is, it, it is done, uh, mm -hmm. how it was done. And they're really talking about how, like, this is very intrusive and it was, uh, well, uh, this sort of intrusion was in the beginning yeah. there, yeah. Uh, in the beginning days of the internet with ARPANET, for example. Let, so let, like, let, yeah. Let's take, for example, this Weber. Uh, you use his essay, Technical Advantages of Bureaucratic Organization. Um, so it's, and I'm also a sociologist. Max Weber is, of course, way before Facebook. He never heard about it. He died before it even started. Why do you think his theory is still relevant on this modern technology? Because Weber uh, basically uh, shoots his shot at uh, really what modernity is. And for him and many other writers after him, it emerges as this kind of system that uh, with bureaucratization, with uh, uh, basically um, sciences and advances of uh, social sciences, it kind of uh, petrifies the world in the sense that it establishes those structures that are really rigid, mm -hmm. that uh, favor kind of repeated behavior and that uh, really kind of um, enclose humans. Yeah. 
Uh, so, for example, you have this with Foucault later, uh, that with the parable of, um, uh, uh, I forgot the word now. Uh, but anyway. We'll, we'll come back to it later. Yeah. Do, do you think that Weber would have made an account on Facebook? As far as I read from uh, lectures on the vocation, I think he wouldn't, but he would criticize that heavily. He would uh, criticize it heavily. Yeah. And uh, um, you also criticize yourself, Facebook. You wrote in your essay, Facebook has a dedication to making us feel bad. Uh, yes, it has a dedication to make us feel miserable because this is what gets the clicks. This is what it serves to us in order to basically have us engage in its mechanisms of uh, data, uh, st mm, data capture. Because it really doesn't care that what what you really think, uh, you know, what you, as in what you really write in the comment, what you really like, etc. It is just its way of basically getting a profile of you so that it can, uh, well, uh, send it to what advertisers. And really, that's what it, all of Facebook was about post two thousand nine when it set up this model. Really. Yeah. But so on the other hand, you could also say Facebook is creating a new comments. It brings people together. Um, for example, also when people are protesting, when people are finding people with the same problems in life, they can share their stories. That might also be a positive side. Yes, there is this sort of digital agora, but it existed before Facebook. We had forums, we had... Uh, we don't need Facebook for that. Yeah, yes, basically that. It's just that we've always communicated over the internet. It's just that, and we've always done this sort of thing where basically, yeah, people shared... Uh, anything about this is what they liked. It's just that with Facebook now, and getting back to neuro rights, it's yeah. really the in, uh, ingression of Facebook into basically our behaviors, shaping yeah. them, uh, managing them, and modeling them to basically the, ad the to basically offer advertisers yeah. what uh, any space of our attention uh, that that they basically they have been able to commercialize with. Really. Yeah. Gaston, if I can ask you a question as well, uh, you are a heavy social media user. I see you a lot on Twitter, you're active on LinkedIn, I think some more on social media. If you hear this story, does it change your thinking? Because that's also one of the goals of the book, about your own behavior. Yeah, I think it's the main thing, of course, is that you should be aware. Uh, so many people are not aware about the way the algorithms indeed affect your mental health. Uh, so the protection uh, that you advocate, is, I think it's very important. But, but again, I mean, so, there are also quite advantages uh, of using those media, but that's the trick, you know. Without advantages, people wouldn't be involved. So um, again, uh, I appreciate, and that's why we included uh, the, the essay, it's not about uh, saying all those digital uh, comments are bad, uh, but you should realize that it really can affect your brains, uh, so your autonomy. Uh, but also uh, your mental health. And I think that is a very important warning uh, in shaping new, but also better comments. Yeah. And, and, and this concept of neural rights, uh, you're also someone who always thinks about plans, who always thinks about how can we implement it in policy, etc. Do, do you have any ideas on that? Yeah, neural rights are, I think, very original. Uh, we might need some elaboration. Because we know human rights, we know citizen rights, but neural rights, uh, the rights to protect your brain, uh, that's quite a novel thing, I would say. Uh, but in modern times, in digital times, in digital common times, I think it would be very important uh, to try to define neural rights, elaborate it, and use it, experiment with it, yeah. before it's too late. Yeah, because <laughs> if there would be policy makers here, uh, let's say we have uh, the mayor of Tilburg, or we have Mark Rutte, our prime minister, and you say, you should do something about neural rights, and he asks, yes, Please, but how? What, what are your thoughts on that? How, how, what should be first steps that we can take? Or is it something that you can do just individually? individually? Sorry. Uh, what I would suggest to the audience is that yeah. if you have, of course, I think it's basically by default on Apple now, but if you mm -hmm. can basically switch off any kind of uh, basically data capture uh, that social media have from your activity, from your phone, etc., please do it. Uh, what we can also do is, for example, turn off on your phones uh, any kind of um, intense color. So, for example, my phone is always on black and white, monochrome. Uh, but basically, yeah, if you can turn that, the, because basically a yeah, bright color really attracts your attention. So if you can turn oh. that off, that's perfect. Yeah. But what we can do within the terms of policy is also not just only think about now, uh, about all the social media, et cetera, and how we can limit the attention capture from that, mm -hmm. but also think about the future. 
and here comes basically the meta, etc. With the, for example, the yeah, the metaverse, Oculus the Rift, uh, uh, Google's that you have, yeah. etc. Right. So basically, what we can do is that we can limit uh, our basically data capture in that. Facebook, for yeah. example, as far as I know right now, doesn't take data from the Oculus Rift and sends it uh, to its servers, etc. But as in my essay, I've shown that it can happen any time that they can change their decision. Right. And uh, well, basically just, uh, well, capture your data or yeah. capture your privacy. Let's so capture some questions from yeah. the audience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Dus hier, uh, en u mag uiteraard ook in het Nederlands vragen stellen. Uh, uw gelegenheid om te reageren, vragen te stellen, opmerkingen, alles is uiteraard welkom. Ik begin even aan deze kant. Oké. Okay. Thank you very much for being here and elaborating. Um, what I'm curious about, so we use the word intrusion to talk about Facebook. But then I think Facebook is an, uh, you're like using Facebook is an act that we engage in voluntarily and at any point in time we have the freedom to just quit the tab. So I'm curious like, can we call an act that at any point in time we are free to stop? Can we call that intrusion? Um, I don't think we can uh, stop at any time that we want. Uh, of course, there's a larger debate about free will, etc., whether we have it or not. But in my opinion, it's really the fact that we have uh, our ability to basically resist all those kinds of intrusion, etc., is uh, unupgradable, really. We have only one mind. It's been there since uh, 100,000 years, at least when basically humans became sedentary. And, well, it's... Uh, Ungradable as for now, of course. But Facebook has those all those models where it can measure your engagement, your activity, and all those models basically can, uh, and of course, talking about all the social media, really, uh, can adjust to engage you more. So it is that you may just think that, okay, yeah, I'm able to turn it anywhere, I w anywhere anytime I want, no, it really works in the background that they can get more attention from you, just learning by who you are. It can be very what addictive. You do. Yeah, yes, like exactly, an and it's really yep. the point that we have, we are uh, in an arms race of unupgradable minds versus upgradable algorithms, and I really yep. think that we should stop that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go to the back, there's a question there. Hey, even wachten tot de microfoon uh, bij is, want anders dan, uh, kunnen we de vraag niet uh, nie verstaan. Even kijken, aan deze kant, u mag het Nederlands of het Engels. Ja, yeah, oké. Okay. Would it be better to call it freedom of thought instead of neuro rights? Like we have freedom of speech, but we yeah. we now engage in the in the situation that we yeah. uh, encounter. Yeah, freedom of thought is yeah. under under attack. Yeah. Is that a better way of calling it freedom of thought, or do you think that's different from what you mean with neuro rights? Uh, it's very different because freedom of thought really, I think, pertains to basically individual opinion. But neuro rights really pertain to basically the ways that Facebook can accelerate uh, our opinions or basically intensify them because it, what it really does is it can, uh, for example, detect that you like one thing and then just, uh, well, by attacking it with ads, etc., can intensify your our likings, etc. It can change the silence on. Uh, our thinking with many issues. So it really doesn't kind of pertain to the opinion per se, it really pertains to the importance of it. Yeah. So it really is different. Yeah. For example, also the example of this pregnant woman has nothing to do with freedom of thought. I mean, exactly. yeah, so there's a difference. Thank you very much for that question. Ja, ik heb een vraag voor Ton yeah. in het Nederlands. Uh, uh, het boek uh, gaat over the Generation Z. Uh, ik ken uh, Generation X and the Lost Generation. What's the Generation Z? Is there nothing? Uh, is there niks meer na Generation Z? Houdt het dan op hier? Wat krijgen we hierna? I think it's probably the same with car plates. So we start again, or we make different combinations. Uh, but uh, well, I, I mean, one warning is important. Um, I mean, um, we are not saying that generations are different across all the lines. That's not true. Uh, so we want to involve the young generations because in the uncommons young people were underrepresented uh, and they are still protested, protesting against that. But concretely, we had um, the generation uh, Y, I, uh, which is uh, the millennials and, well, in general, um, the generation 
Z, Z is defined as being born, say, between 2000 and 2015. Uh, so people that would be, uh, well, if you're born, uh, then you could be like uh, 21, uh, for instance. Uh, so, uh, so in the end, uh, then, of course, uh, we will pass uh, 2015 or 2012, and probably uh, someone will invent a new term uh, for yeah. the next generation. Wha uh, what would your guess be, uh, Ton? What would be the best term? <laughs> you always have ideas. Is it just Generation A or...? Uh, well, I, I think we'll go for another, uh, you know, alphabet structure. So okay. we, we leave alone uh, the classic one and maybe adopt a Chinese... Um, there we go. That's a good idea. Yeah. A question over okay, here. Okay, I got a question. Is it okay for you to put it in English, Don? Yeah, probably, because then you can also follow it uh, as well. Um, I'm curious if you can make a connection about the takeaways from your book with regards to the new comments uh, to the labor market expertise that you possess. Do you see a silver lining there, or do you have any ideas about what should change? Because the labor market is not the Generation Z, but they are going to hire them. So how, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, that that's a very good question. I, I'm talking a lot about a new kind of project or research that I really want to conduct. I, I'm speaking to uh, very young journalists, and it's really about the um, what we see now is that young generations are a bit shying away from work. Like, uh, even if they're still at school, at university, they already know they do not want to work full-time, uh, which is not uncommon in the, in the Netherlands. But um, they seem to have a sort of a radical view that the way work is organized is not very interesting. And they would say, and if you ask them what's the problem, they say in Dutch, we find it not leuk, it's not nice. So what I want to do, is to see uh, how we can form commons that commons of work that work better for young people. Because if we lose young people in a very tight labor market, we will have a tight labor market for the next 25 years. Uh, that's our future. Look at Japan. Um, so we don't want to lose the young generation, but they don't feel, that's a very strange way of expressing this, young people don't feel at home at work. Uh, so what's the problem then exactly and why what is happening because this is quite serious uh, also in the US uh, young people are dropping out and uh, not only the people that come from poor backgrounds or have low education so I think work needs to become a new common and the new yeah. common of work is different and I don't know the English term than putting people in kantoortuinen yeah. uh, which young people really hate uh, so they feel like chicken they, uh, they tell me yeah. So a new common of work is very important to involve young people in the labor market, and um, so we need to side, we, we need to study um, first why they don't like work now or the concept of work, and second, I want to sort of reinvent work. So start from a new, saying okay, we'll just reset work in experiments yeah. and see what comes out. Yeah. Thank you very much for your questions and also for your answers. You get a big round of applause. Thank you very much.